Greetings everyone, welcome to the Worcester Art Museum. As she mentioned, my name is Katrina Stacy. Tonight's event is the sixth and final event in this year's Master Series before we take our summer break. Now it is my honor to introduce tonight's speaker and composer, Sharish Kaur. Sharish arrived in the United States in 1965, already well versed in the traditions of Indian and African music. He studied jazz at Berklee College of Music, Composition and Analysis, with Robert Kogan at the New England Conservatory, and ethnomusicology, especially Asian music, at Brown University. He is a composer with many large-scale instrumental, theater, opera, and chamber music works under his belt. His grants and awards are too numerous to mention, but I will mention them. <laughs> the National Flute Association, Composers Inc., the Fuller Foundation, the Left Foundation, the Fromm Foundation, the Massachusetts Council for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, New England Foundation for the Arts, the Mellon Foundation, the Artist Foundation, Meet the Composer, and the St. Boltoff Club Foundation Award. Currently, he is Professor of Music at the College of the Holy Cross. Without further delay, Sharish Kord. Okay, thank you. First of all, I asked the question, what am I doing here talking about visual art when I'm a composer? So, um, you know, it's one of those um, warnings that, you know, if you see these drug ads that say, you know, you may die from this drug, or, you, you know, Nameda, for example, has this uh, disclaimer. So let me make a disclaimer. My, you, would, you will not die from this uh, lecture, but, uh, but you, you know, you would be better off uh, listening to the art historic aspects of this wonderful scroll from an art historian. My emphasis is going to be really on what I see in the, in the scroll from a composer and a musical viewpoint. And there are many resonances in this, in this uh, wonderful painting uh, that have to do with music. Uh, so this presentation is gonna be in two parts. The first part will focus on the musical and theatrical genres that resonate with Sukiyoko Yoshitoshi's scroll, Fujiwara no Yasumasa playing the flute at midnight which is this wonderful scroll, and I hope you have already seen it in the beautiful gallery and the beautiful exhibition that's uh, on display right now. And the second part is a concert performed by a wonderful flutist who, who's going to join us uh, later, uh, Alice Jones, uh, and she'll be playing three pieces. Um, I want to first acknowledge the Worcester Art Museum and Katrina Stacy for inviting me. Uh, the wonderful acquisitions by that, that are part of this very rich uh, collection of Asian art, so, some of which was uh, acquired under Louise Vergen and Betty Swinton before that. Um, the curator of the current show has done really a magnificent job. So again, if you have not seen the show, please make sure to stroll through and, and look at some of the wonderful woodcut, woodblock uh, prints, etc. cetera. Uh, I wanted to, to also thank my wife, Paula Artal Isprand, who is going to help me in this uh, presentation. Uh, she's going to help me with actually the PowerPoint and playback, uh, YouTube playbacks that I'm going to do because I I have just recently mastered my TV remote, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it would be too risky to try a PowerPoint. And finally, I want to thank Alice uh, for coming from New York to play this piece. Um, okay. Yasumasa playing the flute by moonlight is a hanging scroll painting by Yoshitoshi. It was created in 1882 for a government-sponsored exhibition for the promotion of Japanese art, and it was created at the end of the so-called Edo, or the Takugawa period, which goes from roughly 1600 to 1867, and beginning with the so-called modern period, or the Meiji period. So the, as you can see, the use of very expensive mineral Pigments, gold paint, and applied lacquer reflect the prestigious circumstances of the painting's commission. A combination of traditional Japanese techniques of ink painting with Western techniques such as chiaroscuro and foreshortening reflect new paradigms. Uh, after 1867, the end of the Edo period and the opening of, uh, to the West, um, painters and artists like Yoshitoshi started to uh, incorporate Western perspectives and Western techniques in their, in their work. This painting was once owned by Yoshitoshi's friend, 
Ichikawa Danjuro, who was a leading kabuki actor dancer and who sought Yoshitoshi's advice in stage design and costumes. For those of you who are not familiar with kabuki, kabuki is kind of a cross between Broadway musical, uh, musicals, um, um, burlesque, uh, risque burlesque, you know, maybe striptease and so on. And so it, it's, it's really a very interesting and a very um, mass, you know, um, multi-dimensional theatrical tradition. And Danjuro recreated this scene in a, uh, a kabuki theater play that, that he directed. Uh, it's interesting also, if you, if you walk through the gallery today, you, you will notice that um, Yoshitoshi also created a triptych, a woodblock triptych, in which he portrays three actors, three kabuki actors, and the middle uh, portrait is one of his friend, uh, Danjuro, the, the famous uh, kabuki dancer. So what does the scroll depict? Uh, it depicts a true story, apparently, about a courtier who was also an artist, a poet, and a flute player, a uh, fantastic flute player, Fujiwara no Yasumasa. Renowned for his abilities both as a poet, he escaped death once while walking on the moor one moonlit windy autumn night. He did so famously, continuing to play his flute even when ambushed by the bandit Hakamadare. Yoshitoshi created several woodblock, woodblock prints that depict the Yasumasa story, including two triptychs, which are downstairs. Um, uh, in 19, an 1883 triptych of the same title, a second triptych, Yasumasa uh, and the Outlaw Hakamadare, which is at the bottom, and a woodblock print called Moon Over the Moor. Uh, all these uh, woodblock prints are on display currently, and you, you might want to look at those. There's also another woodblock print that is uh, by a different uh, artist, in fact, it's Yoshitoshi's teacher, that depicts the th same theme. This, so this idea of being entranced by music, the, this idea of uh, rapture that you see Hakamadare, you know, when you look at his uh, expression, for instance, in the original, uh, all these all these aspects are, are very connected to aesthetics of, of a, lots of Asian music, uh, but particularly Japanese music. Uh, in Indonesian music, we call this idea taksu, this idea of being intoxicated by music. In, in Indian classical music, there's this notion of rasa, uh, and so on. So it's a, it's a very powerful theme and a testament to the power of music that, that has been acknowledged by, by many, many cultures. Um, so what I would like to do next is talk to you about some of the flutes that you hear in Japanese music, because clearly the flute is a very important in instrument in Japanese music. In fact, some of the earliest Japanese music, the so-called shomyo Buddhist chant, is made up of uh, flutes playing with either, with chanting, of course, but with, with drums. So, so it's a very important instrument in, in, uh, in Japanese music. Uh, there are many kinds of flutes. The, Hochiku, the Kagurabwe, the Komabwe, the Shinobwe, these four are all bamboo flutes. The, the Suchibwe is an earthen flute. These five flutes are played mostly in folk and tra traditional music. You don't find them so much in classical music. The next three, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today, uh, are, are very interesting and interesting because, you know, the question is, uh, what is the flute player playing? What kind of flute is he playing? What kind of music is he playing? And, you know, that's at least from my perspective, that's very important. So to know what is the sound that he's making that would entrance this bandit to, to stop from attacking him. Uh, the first of those three is called the no, no kan, a transverse bamboo flute that is used in the Japanese no theater. The second is the ryuteki, which is, like, which is I believe, the flute that uh, the, uh, the flute player is playing in the scroll. It's a transverse bamboo flute, which is also used in uh, gagaku, orchestral music of Japan. And the last a very important flute, which, which is not depicted, obviously, in the scroll, is the shakuhachi, which is an end-blown vertical flute that's often used in Zen meditation. I'll talk about that in, in a, few, a few moments. Uh, a picture of a bamboo grove taken by Paola when she was in Japan a couple of years ago. 
Okay, so, so let's turn first to the no khan or the no flute. Uh, as you can see, you can't tell from the, uh, from the slide that's on the right, but the no flute is, uh, which is used, as I said, used in no plays, is much smaller than the one that is uh, used in Gagaku. Uh, and it's very interestingly constructed. It's constructed from, from bamboo. It has uh, seven holes uh, and a fairly, fairly open uh, mouthpiece. Uh, the left hand fingers, the upper three holes, and the right hand, the, the lower four. Uh, just to give you an idea of what that might sound like, uh, let's listen to a short excerpt of a piece for no flute. So first of all, the flute is constructed from dried bamboo split lengthwise into strips turned inside out, which are then wrapped in cherry bark and lacquered. It has a very distinctive piercing sound that might remind you of the piccolo. And it's used in, as I said, in both the no and also in the kabuki theater. But what's interesting about this particular flute is that it has very unusual tuning. And that is that the, the lower octave and the upper octave, the pitches do not match. So um, you know, if you can imagine a piano where every octave is, has different pitches, uh, you you, know, you, you can imagine the kind of chaos that would result if you tried to play on that. So the, the, the piece, uh, the, the, the instrument is used more in improvisatory um, uh, performances uh, or performance styles. It's not a melodic particularly melodic instrument in, in the traditional sense. It actually sounds great for contemporary music, for example. Uh, but, but it is not a very um, systematic instrument, a very difficult instrument to play. So it's used usually in a no drama. Next slide. Uh, a no drama, and I'm just going to give you, uh, you know, a, a very quick uh, sense of what this is about. Um, and it's a, it's a very complex and a very um, deep uh, subject. But what it is, is a, a, a theater uh, that combines folk dances, ancient theatrical and ritual Buddhist traditions into a refined um, form, uh, which is perhaps the best known dramatic art forms of Japan, and it, which comes into focus in the 14th century. Uh, a, a playwright that is very closely associated with No is Muromachi, I'm sorry, uh, Ziami Motokiyo. Ziami was a playwright, and also he, he codified many of the techniques that are used in, in, uh, in No. Now, the the action in No is very, very, very slow. It's very slowly paced. And I don't think you can see that from the slide, but it has a very unique stage, very bare stage. So it's, it's a very austere kind of theater. Uh, a masked actor, sometimes working with one or two uh, assistants, uses very ornate brocade robes. You can see that in the slide. And uh, for some reason, always wears white socks, dances and moves, and sings in in what might be best described of a kind of a recitative, almost spoken, sung, um, and uses all sorts of uh, vocal techniques that are, uh, you know, that are maybe uh, uh, foreign to uh, Western opera, but closer to Peking opera, for instance. Um, it is a high art, meaning that it was really performed at the court and for people in the sort of uh, higher society. It's always accompanied by a chorus 
uh, and always by uh, all the all the actors are are male, and it's an, it has an ensemble on stage consisting of the the flute, which I don't know if you can quite see the no flute uh, in the slide, and three drummers. So it's a very stark sound. It's not lush. It's not rich in that sense. Uh, and it, as I said, it's it's very slight, stylized and very slow, it's very slowly play, paced. So. Um, the sound that you heard, the, the no flute sound that you heard, is uh, very, very unique to to no theater. And it, 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 the flute is used to articulate sections within the play and to create a sort of atmosphere. So it's it's a sort of a special effects flute. Uh, the next kind of flute, and I think this is the one that uh, uh, we should be most concerned with, is the. Ryuteki, but before I do that, I just wanted to give you just a, his sort of a sense of historically the important periods uh, in, in Japanese music. Uh, traditional Japanese music, what we are talking about today, is called Hogaku. Uh, from the 6th through the 10th centuries, the uh, Japanese, uh, were, Japanese people were sent in, into in, in envoys to the Tang court in China, and they encountered musicians from India, from Korea, and so on. And uh, much of the music that they brought back was influenced by Chinese music, Korean music, and to a lesser degree, by Indian music. Uh, the, the sort of high period of, of Japanese music and visual art, including the scroll that we just looked at, is the so-called Edo period, uh, which, I, at which time Japan was closed to outside influence. And this is a time when instruments like the shakuhachi, koto, the ryuteki, the gagaku theater, etc., and especially kabuki, became very popular. And after this period, which is the, roughly the time at which this, the scroll is made, uh, Japan uh, opens up uh, to the West and, and, and tries to starts to model its government education and also imports uh, Western music. So the instrument that I want to talk a little bit about it, that sort of evolved uh, with the so-called gagaku orchestral music is the ryuteki, which you see on the right. And this is obviously the instrument that uh, is is depicted in the, in the piece. It's a flute, uh, just like the no flute, except that it's not it's not a split bamboo. It's a complete bamboo flute underneath uh, a, a wrapping that is made from cherry bark and then lacquered. Very difficult instrument to play. Similar technique to the no. The upper three holes are played by the left hand. The right hand plays the lower three uh, lower three notes. This instrument is used, as I had mentioned earlier, both in kabuki and also in gagaku. Gagaku is a kind of a court music of Japan, and it, it's similar to two other traditions, one in China and one in Korea, that also use uh, a, a large group of forces, uh, as the Gagaku Orchestra does. Uh, it is a continuously changing and developing musical tradition, and depending on which theorist you, you, you read, um, the uh, the period of development is something like 1,500 years. So the, the, these terms, aerophones, chordophones, membranophones, and idiophones refer to the, the various uh, families of musical instruments. Aerophones are wind instruments, chordophones are stringed in instruments, membranophones are drums, and so on, and, and idiophones are self-sounding instruments, for example, gongs and xylophones. So the gagaku has all of those instruments, uh, and the gagaku orchestra, I should say. And the, the ones that are interesting, the most interesting are these three aerophones or the wind instruments, one called the shou, which comes from China. It's, it's very similar to a Chinese instrument called the chung. Uh, the, the instrument on the right is a oboe-like but very loud double reed instrument called the hichiriki. And the instrument below is called ryuteki. It's a side side-blown flute. Um, I think uh, we can go quickly to the next slide. These are some of the stringed instruments, a four-stringed lute-like instrument called uh, biwa and koto you might be familiar with. is a famous uh, zither, 13-stringed instrument that is plucked, and it's very similar to the Chinese uh, chin. Uh, I want you to listen to an excerpt of Gagaku music next. Um, this is a still shot. I don't have a video of them performing.
So what's interesting about it is, first of all, that Ryuteki, the instrument that started the, the piece, um, is it was a very important melodic instrument. What you heard after that was the entrance of the drums. And we'll talk about what the drums did in a second. And then after that, you heard the hichiriki and the show. The sustained kind of pitch cluster that you hear in the back is played by the show. A mouth organ or harmonica-like sound. It's actually very unique. It's a very unique and very interesting sound. And then there was a very loud instrument that came in. That's the, the oboe. Well, we'll listen to it one more time and I'll point those out to you. But what's in interesting about the music from a uh, compositional viewpoint is the very slow pulse. The pulse is very slow, just as in no theater. It's very slow. It's moving at about quarter note equals, for those of you uh, who might be interested in music, it's moving at about quarter note equals 40, which is awfully slow. You know, it's slower than the, than the slowest adagio of Mahler, you know, so it's a kind of a reference point. Uh, and the other thing that's really interesting is that figure that the drummer played. If you, if you remember, it started with where you heard very distinct strokes, then it became very quick, very fast, and almost like a trill, and then gradu gradually sort of scattered in, into nothing, into, si into silence. That shape is, is very important, in, in certainly in Japanese drama, in Japanese music, and I suspect also in Japanese uh, art and, and, and painting. So uh, I am not the person that can point that out to you in the scroll, but that, this is a kind of a leitmotif, a basic idea in, in Japanese aesthetic theory this idea of starting slow, getting very fast until you don't hear the beats, and then gradually scattering and, and moving into silence. You will hear that gesture in, in, in other pieces too. So please listen again to, if you can hear the instruments come in one after the other. And one other point before we go to the example, the texture that the instruments are creating is, is sometimes referred to as heterophonic texture, which means that basically there is a single nuclear or basic melody that's going on which is being played by the Ryu and the other uh, instrument, the hichiriki, is playing another version of the same melody, it's but slightly more elaborate. So, but it's not precisely lining up the, the way, for example, uh, two melodies might line up in, in a Bach uh, invention. Uh, they're slightly off from each other, and it's, it's, it's part of that aesthetic, it's part of the aesthetic, and we refer to that texture as heterophonic rather than polyphonic or homophonic and so on, which, is, which are the more usual textures in, in Western music, although I don't know why we always need to compare anything to Western music. But this is a thing, this is a world in itself, and, and you really have to enter this world with a, almost a different sensibility about color and harmony and texture and so forth. So if you listen again, maybe you can hear that relationship. the show, now Hichiriki. It's really moving very slowly. Here. piece, which is called Etan Raku, is a very famous uh, Gagaku piece, and it's, it's, uh, there are many versions of this piece, but, but it's performed often by Gagaku orchestras. Um, moving on to the next important theatrical tradition that's probably the most relevant in terms of the, the way in which the scroll, uh, Yoshitoshi scroll is laid out and the, the resonances to the scene and so forth is Kabuki theater, uh, which is often thought of as theater with music and dance. The, f the first performance of, of Kabuki uh, theater was in 
1596 by an entirely female cast. Soon after that, it was banned by the government, and now the Kabuki theater is, is uh, performed entirely by men. So they take all the roles, ma the male and the female roles. Uh, and so there is some, you know, uh, if, you, if you look at it carefully, there's obviously, obviously some gender bending going on and uh, all sorts of other risque uh, uh, subjects are, are in, you will encounter in Kabuki. It's very flamboyant, as I mentioned earlier, and colorful. It borrows from no, although it's the antithesis of no in that it's so colorful and so outrageously flamboyant and so forth. It's also related to a, a, another th a puppet theater form called Bunraku, uh, which also borrows from uh, puppet dance idioms. Uh, as I mentioned, dance is an important element, and the kabuki act actors tend to be excellent dancers. Uh, the kabuki, kabuki stage, uh, and this is, this is true for the last three or four hundred years, ha ha had always uh, was always designed with trap lifts uh, to bring musicians and scenery from below, revolving stages allowing for elaborate uh, scenery changes and so on. Uh, and if you will notice, the costumes are extremely elaborate. And so is the makeup and some of the, maybe the next slide you can see the intricate tattoos, not so much here, but the, but the white the white makeup is a very important aspect of this. Uh, again, the instrument that is used in kabuki, the flute, the flute that's used in kabuki is also the ryuteki, the same, same flute uh, that uh, Yoshitoshi is depicted, uh, depicting in his scroll. The, uh, very briefly, the music for the kabuki is very interesting because it has two groups of musicians, a, a group of musicians on stage uh, consisting of strings, wind instruments, including the ryuteki, and an offstage group, which is uh, made up of a smaller ensemble, more like the no ensemble. And this, the offstage ensemble provides special effects like thunder and raindrops and so forth. It, 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 they create all the so-called uh, special effects that what a sound designer in our uh, theater would, would, for example, create. So um, I want to show you, you've already seen the, the, two, the two slides, and I want to now go to the, the, the last kind of music that I want to talk about, which is the music for the shakuhachi, and then we will move to the concert. Uh, the shakuhachi is, is as you see, is also a bamboo flute. I happen to have one with me here, and if anybody wants to look at it, as you can see, it's from the from the from the root of the bamboo, and it takes a long time to find a, a precise uh, a, a bamboo with that sort of uh, diameter and so forth. It has four holes and one hole in the back. And um, it, it is sort of the quintessential um, bamboo flute uh, in Japanese music. So if anybody wants to look at it, you're, even if you drop it, you won't break it. So it's <laughs> okay. It's <all> right. <laughs> okay. So the shakuhachi tradition uh, flourish it again in the, in the so-called Edo period, uh, and it, was, it, it flourished at a time of peace. The samurai class of warriors enjoyed high status during the years of fighting, but afterwards many of the lower ranked samurai were released and became ronin, or wandering uh, masterless samurai. Many became beggars. One group of ronin who joined religious orders were called komuso, or emptiness monks, that was another name for them. Many joined the so-called Fuke sect of Buddhism, which propagated a Zen-like basis for shakuhachi playing. Members of the Fuke sect were required to play the shakuhachi. Zen Buddhism is based on this idea, and I'm going to give you a very, very much nutshell uh, description of Zen. Uh, it's based on this idea that intellect or rational thought is not needed in the pursuit of truth. To be enlightened, one must rely on heightened awareness and intuition rather than logical thinking and scientific uh, investigation. There are various paths to enlightenment, one borrowed from Chinese uh, models, and there's a very interesting uh, 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 painting in the current dis display about uh, Shakyamuni, a, a, a follower of Zen Buddhism, doing what they call Zazen, which is sitting meditation. 
So the idea is if you meditate for many years, you, like the Buddha, you will also be enlightened. And that's, of course, the, the, uh, the goal of, of uh, meditation or, or Zen. And that is called Satori, or in Buddhism it's called Nirvana. In Hinduism it's also called Nirvana. Uh, there's another method to achieve uh, Satori or Nirvana, and that's the use of a koan. A koan is a puzzle which has no uh, no real apparent uh, solution. So it's a, a kind of a curious uh, uh, question that a Zen master might ask a student. So for example, a Zen master might ask a student, um, does a dog have Buddha nature? Does a dog have Buddha nature? What would you say to that? <laughs> I haven't a clue. He would really be pissed off <laughs> and he would react to you you know with a bang on your back or something you know he wouldn't do that to you you're too nice but uh, but he might do that to a student you know so Phil what would you say does a dog have Buddha nature my dog sure didn't have Buddha nature <laughs> he, w he would not be interested in that also like, dog has Buddha nature. would you say that sure that's well, too that's too mild for for uh, for a Zen master. That's too mild an answer. You, I want you to think. You know, the whole idea is for you to think about this, and give it lots of thought. And you might give the the Zen master a response like, "Wow!" <laughs> <laughs> so. The idea is not to give a, 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 a rational answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, so these koans are really wonderful devices, really. Devices to get you off your rational, log logical, scientific way of thinking. Uh, our next slide is a slide on, of another wonderful bamboo flute, uh, bamboo grove, rather. And uh, I have it up there because the uh, the composer Taka Mitsu, whose piece you will hear in the second half performed by Alice, uh, talked about how the sound of the shakuhachi is the recreation of the sound of wind blowing through an old bamboo grove. And I thought this would be a, a, a great, uh, great visual for that. Uh, image. So playing the shakuhachi in the Fuke set was regarded as, as a means to achieve achievement, uh, enlightenment rather. And the spiritual approach to shakuhachi is called sui zen, which means blowing zen. For, the, for this reason, the shakuhachi is not considered to be a musical instrument, but a spiritual tool. According to sui zen, the goal of shakuhachi coincides with the goal of zen, which is to reach enlightenment and, and proceed into unknowing, uh, unlimited knowing. How is uh, this precisely formulated is, is, is a question mark. Uh, and in fact, it would be very un like to formulate this precisely. Uh, an important notion, however, is something that is called enlightenment in a single note, or ichun jobutsu. Uh, one can reach enlighten enlightenment when blowing on a single note. What's the most important aspect of, of shakuhachi playing is something called breath rhythm, or, or breath, uh, breath time. And what that means is that the a, a musical phrase in shakuhachi playing is, is sometimes determined by how long your breath is. So typically you will hear in a shakuhachi phrase a, a loud outburst of breath uh, and then a gradual fading out. You will hear resonances to the johaku thing that we were talking about with the gagaku music. Uh, but most importantly, you will also hear this notion of uh, elastic time. Usually the shakuhachi piece pieces tend to be very uh, beatless. There's no pulse to them. Uh, so why the shakuhachi music when we are talking about Ryuteki and, and Yoshitoshi? Because I feel that in the paint, in, in the scroll, the in, intense uh, way in which Yoshitoshi is depicting the, the flute player reminds me of the intense meditation-like playing that you hear in, in shakuhachi music. And I have no doubt that Yoshitoshi 
new, new shakuhachi music. Um, so uh, there are several pieces in the shakuhachi uh, repertoire that are referred to as Hon Kyuku, which refers to a set of pieces that have to do with Buddhist meditative practice. There are actually about 19 of them. And among them are Empty Bell, a piece that is supposed to echo uh, the same resonance characteristics of a bell, but played on a shakuhachi. Koku, which I'm going to play for you in a second, and Honshirabe, which you will hear later today in today's performance. Can you just hear the koku? So here's an example of uh, shakuhachi playing koku. You get a sense of the shakuhachi. I think it's time to proceed to the second part of the presentation. And I want to introduce you to Alice Jones, who's going to play three pieces, uh, Honchi Rabe, Itinerant, and then Tenderness with Cranes. Thank you very much.
<clears throat> so the last piece on the program is Tenderness of Cranes, a piece that I wrote in 1992 when I was searching for a way of reconciling uh, my, my feelings about Western uh, modernist composition versus uh, other ways of thinking about the material. And uh, I was really taken by both Zen philosophy and also the techniques of shakuhachi playing. So this piece is based on one of the Fouquet sect uh, pieces that I mentioned earlier. The piece that it's based on is called Suru no Sugomori, which means nesting cranes. My piece is called Tenderness of Cranes. And uh, what it is made up of is two kinds of material, uh, shakuhachi phrases, which are uh, commented on by very different kinds of materials. And the two sort of strands come together at the very end. Uh, you'll hear some techniques that are very closely related to shakuhachi music, and also some that you already heard in the, uh, in the Takamitsu piece. So.
thank you, thanks. Amazing, amazing. Great. Alice, that was amazing. That's really good. Thanks. Yeah. So. Thank you very much. Thanks. I wrote onomatopoetically across the cover page of the screenplay in big black letters. <laughs> then I capped his pen, put it back on his leather writing pad, and said, that's how we scream in my country.